For a relaxed, get away from it all holiday, visit Kinsale in the sunny southwest. Lays in a boat along its Atlantic shore, anchor at Fox's Bay, Roach's Bluff, or Sweeney's Well, or just lounge in the shade of the tree lined beaches. If you feel more energetic, you could always climb Fogarty's Hill or nearby Fergus Mountain. And for the really enterprising, there's a day trip up the Galway Volcano. Or if you just want to take it easy, why not rent a holiday villa with its balcony looking west over the Atlantic? Yes, every taste is catered for in Holiday Kinsale. Unfortunately, it's a bit far to take the wife and family. To be precise, 4,128 miles from Cork, give or take a few. It's on the Emerald Isle, all right, and they'll feel quite at home among its Atlantic beaches, green fields, harps and shamrocks. But the trouble is that this Kinsale is at the wrong side of the Atlantic. It's Kinsale in Montserrat, a West Indian island, the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean, and home of a unique race of people, the Black Irish. There's a spot in me heart which no colleen me own. There's a depth in me soul never sounded unknown. There's a place in my memory, my life, that you feel. No one ever take it, no one ever will. Sure, I love the dear silver that shines in your hair and the brow that's all furrowed and wrinkled with care. I kiss the dear fingers so tall worn for me. Oh, God bless you and keep you, Mother McCree. There's much in Montserrat besides Mother Macree to remind Patrick Robert Riley of his ancestral home. Though now a British colony, evidence of Irish origins are as aggressive in Montserrat as in Boston or New York. And the harps and shamrocks are not just commercial emblems. The first three governors of Montserrat were Irish born, and the local police are proud of the Kathleen O'Hulahan figure with harp and cross, which forms their coat of arms. So Montserrat makes quite a fuss of St. Patrick's Day aided and abetted by Patrick Robert Riley. Lately it has become um, quite a big day. The radio stations seem to devote almost the whole day, or almost the whole day, to um, singing Irish songs, interviewing people about Irish customs and so on. And I usually have the honor of being called, because I usually um, go down to town dressed all in green on St. Patrick's Day. And, well, the folks actually look out and said, here comes Mr. St. Patrick. <laughs> the title Emerald Isle of the Caribbean is given to Montserrat partly because of the lush green foliage of its countryside. The colour green is everywhere, on roofs, doors, notices and school uniforms. But there's a good deal more to the Irish connection than a mere identity of national colour. This is standard four in the Infant Jesus Preschool in Plymouth, Montserrat. The faces may not be terribly familiar to you, but I think some of the names will. Mrs. Catherine Ryan is the teacher. Mrs. Ryan, could I have a look at the uh, uh, list of names and see if I recognize some of them? There's uh, Devon Riley, Sherilyn Ryan, uh, Joanne Burke. Let's try some of the names. What's your name? Eugene Fleming. Eugene Fleming. Is that right? Eugene Fleming. Good man, Eugene. And what's yours? Sean Castles. Sean Castles. And what's yours? Jerome Mead. Jerome Mead. Is that it? Hmm? Yeah. Good man. Now let's try some of the girls. Um, what's your name? John Burke. What is it? John Burke. Joanne Burke. Is that right? Good girl, Joan. And what's yours? Michelle Castles. Michelle Castles. And what's your name? Irish. What's your first name again? 
Irish. Colleen, is it? Colleen Irish, is that your name? Yeah. Good girl, Colleen. And what's your name? Michael Ryan. Michael Ryan, well done. And what's your name? Marianne Carty. Marianne Carty, is that it? Good girl, Marianne. And what's your name? Sandra Farrell. Sandra Farrell. In fact, well over half the names of the 13,000 people who now inhabit the island of Montserrat are distinctively Irish. In parts of the island, the proportion of Irish names would be as high as 9 out of 10. Apart from the more familiar Irish names, you also get words like Irish, Dublin, Cork, even Kinsale used as surnames, which would seem to make the Montserrat children more Irish than the Irish themselves. The first Irish landed in Montserrat in 1632, at this bay, Kinsale Bay. The plantations just inland from here are still to this day known as Broderick's Estate, O'Gara's Estate and Galway Estate. And the little village just around that headland is St. Patrick's Village. Who were they, these first Irish settlers? Well, a group came out from Cork with names like Barry, Sullivan, Driscoll, Roach and Ryan. And they settled in the neighboring island of St. Kitts hoping to trade in tobacco there. But after a few months, they had such violent rows with the English Puritans in St. Kitts that they left there for the smaller island of Montserrat, and they hoped peace. It was the feeling of despair after the Battle of Kinsale which drove these first settlers out of Ireland. The name Kinsale was obviously prominent in their minds as they gave it to their first landing place in Montserrat. Andrew Parr, who died in 1720 at the age of 56, may have been the son of one of those first adventurers who crossed the Atlantic to St Kitts and thence to Montserrat. A second group of Irish settlers arrived in Montserrat at about the same time as the St Kitts evacuees, and they landed down there at Carr's Bay. They came from Virginia in America. Lord Baltimore was just crossing the Atlantic to organise his settlement of English Catholics in Maryland. He brought with him his chaplain, an English Jesuit, Father Andrew White. With typical Jesuitical industry, Father White kept a diary of the voyage. January 26th, 1633. By noon we came before the island of Montserrat, wherein is a noble plantation of Irish Catholics, whom the Virginians would not suffer to live with them because of their religion. So two groups of Irish came to Montserrat from places over a thousand miles apart in each case as victims of religious persecution. For almost 10 years, these two groups of Irish settlers found peace. The high mountainous ridge down the centre of Montserrat gave abundant water and the warm, moist climate enabled them to farm almost as they had in Ireland. Cattle were exported from Galway to Montserrat and seemed to thrive when crossed with the local stock. But now the Irish were the masters, and like all other West Indian planters, they had their quota of African slaves. A census of Montserrat taken in the mid-17th century lists the population as Irish, 2,000, English, 700, Scots, 52, African slaves, 1,000. It's a widely held view in Montserrat today that the Irish landowners treated their slaves with more care and kindness than did the English and Scots. However true that may be, there's still a warm welcome for the Irishman in Montserrat today, as Corkman Barney Columbia found when he came to settle here in retirement. We have the sea, on my side anyhow, we have the sea below us and the mountains rising up behind, and very much like oh, the southwest of Ireland. So that, I think, was one of the first things that made me feel that I'd like to stay here. And after nine and a half years, I'm still in love with the place, and I wouldn't want any place else except possibly to go back to Ireland. A number of the first Irish settlers were families who had been deprived of their land by the English plantation. The first governor of Montserrat, Anthony Brisket, was a Wexford landlord, removed from his Irish estate in 1613. In compensation for his confiscated Wexford land, he was given a commission by the British Crown 
to travel to the West Indies and set up a plantation in Montserrat. Several of the farmlands of the island still bear the names of their original Irish owners, Farrell's estate, Furlong's estate, O'Gara's estate, Sweeney's estate. Overgrown now and abandoned, this estate, known as Blake's estate, dates back to the year 1646. In that year, John Blake, the mayor of Galway, was dispossessed of his Galway estates by the Cromwellian planters. Blake moved to a smaller farm in Mullamore, but his two sons couldn't put up with this change of fortune. So they sold out in Galway and moved to the West Indies, where they bought this plantation in Montserrat. There now began a lively commercial exchange between Galway and Montserrat, the two sons exporting tobacco and sugar to Galway, and the father exporting cattle from Galway to Montserrat and Barbados. But the West Indies soon began to import beef from Virginia and Bermuda, and with transatlantic freight prices running high, the trade to and from Galway diminished. The tobacco crop too declined for a few years. So Thomas Blake sold his Montserrat farm to his cousin and on the proceeds returned to Galway where he bought the Renville estate. The farm gradually ran down. The estate of another Galway family, the Kerwins, is still a going concern. The current price of rum per barrel or the most fancied runner of the 330 in Bridgetown next Saturday are still discussed in the elegant rooms of this typical planter's house. The records of his mother's family, the Galway Kerwins, who left Ireland 300 years ago, are carefully guarded by the present owner, John Hollander. Through the, the, the um, history of Galway, uh, we see that they had 12 leading families there. And it's the funny thing is that we, we have practically all the names of those families. We have the Blakes, the Bodkins, the Browns, the Darcy's, the Deans, the Frenches, the Joyce, the Kerwins, the Lynch, the Martins, the Morrises, and the Skerritts. And in the history of Galway, it, it says that um, John Kerwin buying the castle of Haggett and doing it up. And um, he put, up, put in new um, glass windows instead of the leaden louvers that were there before, through the fortune that he'd made from his properties that he had in the West Indies. What year would that be about? Uh, 1680 or something, they have that in, in, in the as. Most Irish planters didn't make a fortune in Montserrat, but they did hold on to something more precious, their faith. This is the Galway estate, one of the earliest of the Irish plantations, covering the side of one of Montserrat's three volcanic mountains. These ruins were once the quarters of the slaves of the Galway family. Irish planters were the first to allow their slaves to be baptised and to give them freedom. Just beyond the ruins of the slave quarters is the striking remains of what is probably the oldest Catholic church on the island. But the first Irish settlers didn't long enjoy freedom to worship here. By the 1640s, the persecution they had fled from followed them to Montserrat. Dr Howard Fergus, University Lecturer in Plymouth, has just completed a history of the island. I asked him what brought about this change in the fortunes of the Irish in Montserrat. I think that this had to do with their religion, which was Roman Catholicism. Uh, in fact, although the English in St. Kitts, which is just nearby, did make a treaty uh, with the French in 1627 against their common enemy like the Spanish and the Caribs, the English never really trusted the French, and this was partly because of their religion. This is why, for instance, uh, England occupied the center of St. Kitts while the French were at both ends. So that when Montserrat be became the asylum for Roman Catholics from Ireland and elsewhere uh, next door, uh, the English were again suspicious of the Irish and consequently of the people in Montserrat. And why should this suspicion of the French transfer to the Irish? Well, um, as you know, the French were essentially Catholics, and uh, it, was, it, it was feared that, especially with um, events in England, 
you know, happening in, in, in this short period, that the Irish in Montserrat and the French Irish in St. Kitts uh, could rise up. In other words, there could be a rebellion in Montserrat against the planter lords. So suddenly and with relentless vigour, the tide began to run against the Irish Catholics of Montserrat. Twice the French conquered the island, but each time they were beaten off by the English. This left the Puritans in power. Anti-Catholic and afraid of another French-Irish alliance, they kept the Irish down. Attendance at Mass was forbidden. Catholic priests were denied entry. The Irish appealed to Rome for a priest, and in 1650 a Limerick Jesuit, Father John Stritch, volunteered to make the dangerous journey. He first travelled to St Kitts, and after a few months set sail for Montserrat. There was little hope of his getting past the port authorities dressed as a Catholic priest, so Father Stritch disguised himself as a timber merchant. He set up camp, carrying on his timber business by day, and by word of mouth let the Irish know of his real identity. He risked imprisonment if caught, and so did all who came to receive the sacraments from him. He speaks of the joy of the Irish when they heard he had arrived. They came to Mass at his hideout, travelling at night and using cliff paths so as to avoid the roads where guards were posted. We owe it to Father Stritch's records for the account of the barbarous story of Crab Island. The Puritans arrested one night 125 of the leading Irish citizens of Montserrat and dumped them on an uninhabitable chunk of rock called Crab Island. They managed to survive there for a few days on whatever they could gather at the seashore, but after a while they signalled a Spanish boat which stopped. The boat was too small to carry the whole party, but it did take a group of them to the French island of Guadalupe, where they were warmly welcomed. As for the others, no one is quite sure what happened to them. But the commonest story is that they built a raft in the hope of escaping from Crab Island, but it foundered in the Caribbean Sea and they were all drowned. The largest number of Irish emigrants to the West Indies didn't belong to the planter class. They were workers who travelled to the West Indies as servants. The indentured worker was given a free passage across the Atlantic. In return, he would work as a slave for a period of five to seven years. During that time he got no pay, had no rights and lived in primitive conditions. His only real right was that when the period of indenture was over he was set free and given a plot of land to work for himself. A great number of the Irish immigrants were either indentured servants or prisoners. They arrived here at the wharf in Montserrat. The first of the indentured servants were only finishing their time of service when the sugar boom hit the West Indies. Montserrat planters turned to sugar and the price of land rocketed. There were no longer any small plots available for the freed indentured servants. The problem was added to by the fact that sugar is a labour-intensive crop and thousands of workers were required to harvest the cane. The African slaves hadn't yet been imported in any great numbers, so the prisons of Ireland were emptied of anyone, political prisoner or criminal, who was strong enough to make the crossing of the Atlantic and harvest the sugar. In parts of the West Indies, ghetto colonies of the descendants of these white workers still exist. Still working class, in an environment where the white people belong almost exclusively to the management class, they are a source of curiosity to the well-off. Smarting under the name of red legs from their black neighbours, they have largely kept to themselves, and especially married only within their own race. They have adapted unsurely to local conditions. Their white skins, fragile and delicate under the continuous tropical sun. Skin disease is common. Many of the younger ones emigrate to Australia or the United States. But in Montserrat, the indentured workers found themselves at home much more quickly. Undoubtedly, the decision to intermarry with the Negro population was a major factor in this. Not that all of the Irish in Montserrat made the adjustment to a new way of life with equal ease. The courtroom in Plymouth has heard quite a few Irish names, and still does even today. Monday's court. Noel Skerritt, larceny. Joseph Galloway, throwing missiles in decent language. Neville Dwyer, battery. Sylvester Hogan, larceny. Raymond O'Gara, in decent language, arming with offensive weapons, throwing missiles. Martha Skerritt, larceny. Tomorrow's court. William Sullivan versus Donald Fergus, assault and battery. Agnes Roach versus Maggie Buffant, damages for trespass. 
Donald Sullivan versus Cathy Mead, Assault and Battery. It looks as if we handed on more than just our names. The home of Mr and Mrs Allen is also the local post office. Their soft accents are typical of Montserrat and might easily be confused with the lilt in parts of West Cork and Kerry. Well, my mother was a white lady. Uh, she was born at Beacus Hill and they were living there. They had a estate there. We have Allen's, Daly, Sweeney's, Ryan. They're all related to you, are mm, they? They are all one relation. Now, how did the family come to Montserrat, Mr. Allen? Well, the Irish people came to Montserrat on account of Cromwell, where he was exiled. Uh, they, we heard they had some fighting there, and uh, the Irish people came and he was inside. So they was sent out of the island. So, and we are some of the older descendant remains. And did your, your, did your mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, did they have any memories of Ireland or did they talk about it or anything like that? Well, his dad told us what we hear. The Sweeney's have been in Montserrat for over 10 generations, but Grandma Sweeney looks and sounds as if she'd just come from a good summer holiday in Ballycotton. In 1969, I went to New York. So in my visit, uh, people ask me anything, and when I speak, they say, you can see I come from Ireland. Every talk I talk, they say I come from Ireland. And I resemble them in the everything. So that's the reason why we are here in Monstrat, as island people. When they asked you, did you come from Ireland, what did you say? I said, sure. My, um, grandfather and my father were quite light-skinned and in fact my grandfather had blue eyes and straight hair because one of my uncles <laughs> my, my daughter and I had such a joke one of my uncles who died about five years ago in Ohio in the United States when he was admitted to the hospital I guess the nurses didn't worry to ask him what his ethnic origin was they just put him down as white and we had such a joke <laughs> when he went into the hospital and you know they gave you this form to be filled out the people of Montserrat today couldn't list many of the great names of Irish history, but there are two they all know, Arthur Guinness and Oliver Cromwell. The name of Guinness is, of course, held in high esteem, while that of Cromwell is mentioned with almost the same dread as in Ireland. It was under the press gangie of Cromwell that hundreds of people from Cork, Kilkenny and Drogheda were expelled to the West Indies. They would have arrived just as the first importations of African slaves took place. So, both cruelly uprooted from their homes, Irish and African Negro shared a common suffering, a common grievance, and for the most part lived together in peace and common understanding. However, there is a record of one insurrection of black slaves against their Irish masters. St. Patrick's Day was chosen because the Irish would have been celebrating that day, and um, the the, the slaves thought that this was a good day to perhaps take them unawares. Uh, in, in the end, the plot was betrayed by slaves themselves, and this could stem from perhaps some love for the Irish masters, I don't know. There have been some wild to stories told about it, but it, it never amounted to anything much. Um, they blamed some old woman they called her Fanny Garby or something because she um, is supposed to let the cat out of the bag before it actually happened or something. Whether that's true or not, I really can't tell you. But Do you think that the relationship between the, the slaves and the Irish settlers were better in Montserrat than they were, say, between slaves and English settlers or other settlers in the other islands around? Well, that I couldn't answer because, I, w of course, when I arrived out here, everything of slavery was over. and. Even so, when, when they say that slavery was abolished in 1832 or something like that, or forget the year, it had been finished before that. It wasn't economical to keep. But, and people had they'd found that they had to give them freedom to, to get them to do anything that, for years before. 
The fact that many Montserrat people have Irish names does not necessarily mean they have Irish blood. Just before slave emancipation in the early 19th century, hundreds of Negroes were baptized. As slaves, they had no surnames, so they took the name of their master or of the plantation. Father Patrick O'Brien, an Irish missionary who came to Montserrat in 1777, administered these mass baptisms. His old baptismal registers have been studied by his successor, Belgian missionary Bishop Anthony de Metz. Well, when you consider the register of Father Patrick O'Brien, you notice pages and pages which names of slaves written in a hurry, badly written, had a good handwriting, but this is kind of badly written, written in a hurry, and at the end of four or five pages of names, you would just have the estate's name, the name of a godfather and a godmother, meaning all those people became Catholics in one day. And then a few days later, you find the same thing about another estate. So you can see that hundreds and hundreds, remember there were something like 10,000 slaves in Montserrat in those days. So you find hundreds and hundreds coming over in one day. This is the cemetery of the Anglican Church of St. Peter's in the north of Montserrat. Of the hundreds of headstones that stand here, I could count fewer than 12 that don't bear Irish names. Sweeney, Fergus, Allen, Lee, Hogan, Burke. The great majority of these must once have been Catholics. How is it they now lie in a Protestant graveyard? In 1834, when the slaves were given their emancipation in the West Indies, the Montserrat slaves took Irish names and were baptised Catholic, five out of six, so that by 1835, five out of six of the population of Montserrat was Catholic. Now, 140 years later, the percentage is one in ten Catholic. What happened? It's possible to speculate on the effect of proselytism over the years, or the denial of civil rights to Catholics, which lasted well into the 19th century. And probably the real and the truest reason, however, is that for the last 70 years of the 19th century, the Catholics in the north of Montserrat had no priest, no mass, and no services that they could recognize. So it's natural that they turned to the church which seemed closest to what they had known before, the Anglican church, with its tabernacle, its sanctuary lamp, its candles, vestments, stations of the cross. Montserrat Catholics today are centred mainly on the area around Plymouth. This is probably due to the influence of one of the most famous Montserrat Irish families, the Hamiltons. Before the Catholics were allowed to have a church in the town, the Hamiltons gave their large business premises on Parliament Street as a place of worship. The building is still called Tresellion, or Shamrock House. The occasional priest visitor to Montserrat said Mass there. It kept a remnant of the faithful together. I pray, Lord, that whatever I do or whatever my hands find to do, Lord, it may be prosperous. I pray that whatever I do, it may be a help to others. What I can do, Lord, help me to do. Give me courage that I might be able to learn and labor truly for my honest living, that I will never beg my bread as long as I live to Lord. But whatever their present religious affiliations, the people of Montserrat still have a faith in the presence of God and the reality of his will in their lives, which is very similar to the country faith of the Irish. You know, in uh, the west of Ireland particularly, there are so many oh, very poor people who have so little. And they seem to be, well, satisfied or content and an expression I used to hear so often amongst them, God is good. And this, all the people here seem to have the same faith and a belief in the Almighty, and that they don't worry. They are content, even though they have so little. And they're very, very much alike in their ways. I think they probably well, there's some of the Irish handed down to him. There must have been times when the Irish emigrant workers in Montserrat felt 
as if they were walking through the deep mists of a soft summer's day in Ireland. 4,500 miles to the northeast lay home, but once they left it, few returned to make that long and expensive journey across the Atlantic. So they tried to make Montserrat a home from home, a place where the old Irish customs and comforts would be enjoyed and preserved. I've always heard that um, we speak with a distinct Irish brogue. <laughs> yes, they have somewhat of a similar act. And then, of course, the, you'll find a number of redheads, which would be a, an Irish characteristic also. But I know from tourists who come over, they tell me, oh, yes, Bishop, these are Irish. We notice it by the names. So many have black hair, blue eyes, been very beautiful. And then they speak so often about the weather. And that's what we always do in Ireland. They begin the conversation by speaking of the weather. That came to Menstrua traditionally, I think, because my mother told us of illicit distilling, distilling in the mountains. And the distillers used to seek a very uh, a, a valley away from, uh, almost away from habitation to do the distilling. And um, this rum was called Mountain Dew. And it was perfectly white, not colored at all. It was sold very cheap. I think it was three penny for a half a bottle then. Oh, they were terrifically fond of wakes. <laughs> when anybody died, eh? there was a huge party that night for them to sort of keep company with, to keep them all company. And of course, the, the coffin had to be built locally and all that and done in the yard and that while they. Thing. But I know, I know when I came out, the, the, the wake was the, the famous Irish um, tradition of, of, of keeping up the wake. Are you a dancer yourself? Not very much, but my mother was a great dancer. And at evening sometimes when she was at leisure, she used to dance the jig and show us the real Irish dance. So um, it's, Irish is really seem to be in the blood. It is. <laughs> Ethnologists have described the Irish as the whitest race in the world. Certainly in the US, where Irish and Negro have lived in close proximity, the result has often been acute tension. Yet here in Montserrat, Irish and Negro have lived side by side in peace. Black or white, most of them didn't choose to come to Montserrat. Yet once here they formed a relationship which must be almost unique. It survived the running battles of French and English settlers, it survived the social revolution which brought about the ending of slavery. It even survived an occasional internal insurrection. And in Montserrat, Irish and Negro haven't just lived together in peace as two separate communities, but have merged into what is in effect almost a new race, black in colour, but possessing many of the best traits of the Irish. Perhaps the white Irish of Ireland and America today have something to learn from the black Irish of Montserrat. I've heard that the Irish are very friendly people, and I think that we took uh, pages out of the, of the Irish book for friendliness. In fact, Montserrat is known to be one of the most, or the most friendly island of the West Indies. You find people, as they go along, they say, good morning, good afternoon. They, they, they like to converse. I mean, strangers don't look like strangers to them. They, they, they're really very friendly and hospitable. <laughs> so, and I think that, um, Typical of the Irish, very um, typical of the Irish.